I think uh, since it's 6 p.m., we can uh, get a good uh, head start. Um, and uh, we have a few participants with us on, uh, on Zoom, and I'm sure a bunch of other people will be tuning in on Facebook Live as well. Uh, perhaps a few people know uh, Chris from, uh, I think, our very first speaker at the summit 2019. That's right. Uh, yeah, uh, as our theme was all about growth and uh, a lot of Chris's work involves uh, scaling and growth, it made total sense for him to open up the summit for us. And I'm just going to give a very short bio and then we can get into the, uh, the presentation and some Q&A after. Um, so Chris is the co-founder of the Global Scaling Academy, uh, which teaches individuals and organizations how to plan for and execute hypergrowth. And he's also the co-founder of Blitzscaling Ventures, which invests in the world's fastest growing startups. Um, he's founded, advised, or invested in over 100 tech start, high tech startups since 1995, including nine figure companies like uh, Ustream or Usertesting.com. Um, he is the co-author, of course, uh, with Reid Hoffman of Blitzscaling the Lightning Fast Path um, to Building Massively Valuable Companies, and the co-author with Reid Hoffman and Ben Kasnocha, Kasnoka. Kasnoka. It's hard to pronounce. It's unusual. <laughs> of the uh, New York Times bestseller, The Alliance Managing Talent in the Networked Age. Um, and Chris has two degrees from Stanford University with distinction in both, and an MBA from Harvard uh, Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar. So uh, that's a short introduction. <laughs> and um, uh, Chris has a presentation prepared, which we'll get uh, right, uh, right into it. And then we can, uh, we can take questions and answers. So go ahead. Fantastic. And again, thanks everyone for having me on this morning, this yeah. evening, wherever in the world you happen to be, in whatever time it happens to be. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go relatively quickly through a presentation to just give you some sense of how I'm thinking about the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic and what impact it's going to have on you as entrepreneurs and leaders. And then we'll open it up to questions and I'll stick around and answer as many questions as I can. Now, what I do want to point out, of course, is that I am not a medical doctor. You'll notice when we went through my list of degrees, none of them included MD, PhD from Harvard Medical School or anything like that. So bear in mind that this is the advice from a layman, someone who spent way too much time uh, reading articles about the novel coronavirus and thinking about it, but not someone who is an epidemiologist, medical doctor, or otherwise qualified. So please do not go out and follow my medical advice. But hopefully, uh, when it comes to the business advice around this, it'll provide you with some interesting thoughts, uh, some ways of thinking about it. Even though I'm not going to make any specific predictions about how long this is going to last, what I'm going to try to do is give you guys some sense of leading indicators to watch out for so that in whatever market you're in, you'll be able to look at those leading indicators and decide what sort of actions to take. So let me go ahead and dive into the presentation. I'm going to go into my PowerPoint slideshow mode. And assuming, I assume everyone can see it. Uh, if you want to give a thumbs up or something like that, let me know. Make sure that the PowerPoint is showing. Great. So let's talk about what's going on in the world with the coronavirus. Uh, one of the things that's difficult is this crisis has arisen and, and developed so quickly that we don't have a lot of good data. Yes, there are projections about what it's going to do to the economy. I know in the United States, those projections range anywhere from, you know, that it's going to cause the economic, uh, economic indicators to go down by 20 to 30%. Some people are saying 50%. Really hard to say. And there's not a lot of hard data. One of the few places where there was some data is it looks like Singapore, which did a good job of containing the coronavirus, but obviously had to institute a lot of radical changes, was showing a 10% drop in quarter over quarter growth. So it actually contracted 10%. So there is definitely going to be an impact. Since those numbers are trailing indicators, what I'm going to do instead is focus on uh, some information that's basically real time, which is stock market performance. Stock markets do not represent the entire economy, of course, but they do represent how people are feeling about the situation and generally do a good job of reflecting real-time sentiment. And what I'm going to do is going to look through a couple of different stock market graphs and help you think about, well, what's been happening? So the first is just to take a look at what's happening overall in the world. Uh, as you can tell, the coronavirus is really taking off. This data is as of yesterday. 
And you can see this is a pretty scary graph. But the most important thing to do is to not look at the graph from a linear perspective, but from a logarithmic perspective. The important thing to note is that the coronavirus is an exponential threat. And to really understand the scope of an exponential threat, we have to look at it from an exponential or logarithmic perspective. So when we look at the logarithmic scale, what does this tell us about what's happened so far? Well, basically the story on the left-hand side of the curve is the virus arising in China and a couple of other locations, but primarily in China and ultimately largely being controlled only for the coronavirus to then begin taking off in the rest of the world. And when you hear people talk about flattening the curve, they're talking about the curve that occurs uh, in this logarithmic scale. And as you can tell, over on the total cases and total deaths, that curve doesn't look very flat. It was flat for a while, but starting in March, which is just this month, amazingly enough, uh, it clearly got out of control. So what does this tell us? Well, you gotta look at those log scales to understand the exponential growth. The other thing that's important to note is that the number of deaths trail the diagnosed cases by 10 to 14 days. And this is important because the number of cases is highly dependent on the amount of testing being done, but the number of deaths is more reliable. It's still not completely reliable because there are plenty of people who are dying and their cause of death is not listed as coronavirus because they never got a test, but they are probably dying. So the deaths are probably an underestimate, but nonetheless, it should be directionally correct in thinking about this. So let's talk about some stock markets. First of all, there's the Chinese stock market. This is the Shanghai index. And what I've done is I've sort of looked at them uh, and said, well, what has the market done so far in 2020? In the case of Shanghai, it's down about 10%, but it's not a smooth decline. As you can tell, what occurred was a sudden panic drop uh, after it became apparent that the coronavirus was very serious. But then as they got the pandemic under control in China, the stock market began to rise again. Yet curiously enough, if you look into March, all of a sudden the stock market begins to decline again. Now, why is that? Uh, it, especially when you look at the total coronavirus deaths, and this is a perfect flattening of the curve. So why is it that out in March, on that flat portion of the curve, we see a sudden dramatic drop in the stock market? Well, at first, the bending of the curve really did correlate with the rally, but then the index dropped. So what's happening? Well, let's take a look at another stock market, the Korean Composite Index. We see something that's a little simpler here. We see, in fact, a rapid drop again in that March timeframe in the stock index. And again, this is a bit puzzling because if you look at the curve of coronavirus deaths in South Korea, this is again a curve that is largely flattened out after an initial surge, and it's been flattened out at a very low number of total deaths. Again, that precipitous drop in March, despite the flattened curve. And then of course, let's look at Italy. Uh, this is a slightly different graph. I couldn't get the Italy stock market graph on my preferred vendor, so I went and got a different one. And we see the same thing. In fact, since Italy has been the hardest hit on a per capita basis, we see its stock market is down 28% in 2020. And in this case, it has a different pattern. We see the declines beginning as the uh, Italian pandemic began to rage out of control and then further declines starting in March. And in fact, you can see, again, there is some, there is some flattening that, of deaths that picks up around the second half of March, but it still isn't flattened yet. It still doesn't look like those Chinese curves. So what is the thing that is driving all of this? Well, here's the US stock market, the S&P 500. And again, we see that decline in March. And what we see in the coronavirus graph of deaths for the United States is a completely unflattened curve that begins rising upwards at an exp exponential rate starting on March 1st. And you can see that's a trail that will extend it out a little bit further for the coronavirus cases. Again, you see right around March 1st, that dramatic rise in the curve. So what has happened in the US stock market? Well, we did see a rally in the stock market based on the stimulus news, but I don't expect this to be persistent because the outbreak is not under control. We look at those curves, we see they're clearly not flattened. But the other part of it is that in this global economy, your own country's progress is a factor, but not the dominant one. The reason I posit that 
China's stock market is down, South Korea's stock market is down, despite the fact that they have their outbreaks largely under control, is because of the global contagion economically. The United States is their most important export market. China's economy depends on exporting to the United States. And obviously, until the United States is able to control its outbreak and resume normal economic operations, other countries are going to be affected. So in looking at the coronavirus outbreak and understanding how it's going to affect you, you have to look at it from a global perspective, not just the perspective of your individual company, country or region. Uh, I will note that some of this is a regional effect. If you think about Europe, for example, uh, a lot is going to depend on what happens in Germany. If you think about the MENA region, think about the major trading partners that your country has. And if you're not the dominant player, if you're not the Germany or the United States or the China, look at the regional hegemon and see how their outbreak is going because that is likely to be the factor that determines what actually happens. So the key question then becomes, are we facing a recession or a depression? Is this something where we're going to see a V-shaped recovery where very quickly people are going to be able to power out of this? Or are we going to see something that is U-shaped where there is going to be a longer period of time where there's economic pain and where businesses are going to suffer? Well, I can't actually tell you which it's going to be because so much depends on how people actually react to the coronavirus. Uh, I can tell you the circumstances under which we're going to see a quick recovery. We're going to see a quick recovery if it turns out that the virus isn't that bad. Personally, I don't hold out that much hope for this, but it is theoretically possible. Uh, it, just, it, it's, it just is difficult to imagine that something that has affected places like Italy or New York City this badly is actually just a mild flu. Uh, I think that that is not something that's really in the possibility set. I think that we'll have a quick recovery if we see some effective treatments emerge and get approved in the next 30 days. The reason it has to happen soon is because it takes time for treatments to be produced as well. Uh, there are some treatments, potential treatments like hydroxychloroquine uh, that the president of the United States has been very enthusiastic about where we are actually seeing shortages of the drug because people are snapping it up. And those people who were previously using drug for treatments of diseases such as lupus are actually facing shortages. So it takes time for the supply chain to actually ramp up and begin producing treatments. Third, we can see a quick recovery if globally we'll have the testing capacity to test everyone and quarantine the infected, not just to confirm diagnoses for the very sick. One of the reasons why the number of cases is a dramatic underestimate right now is that there is a lack of testing capacity, not just in the United States, but everywhere around the globe. Uh, and the, the lack of testing capacity in the United States has been very widely written about. Uh, at this point, the United States has greater testing capacity than any other country in the world, but it still is the case that in the major areas of outbreak, tests are reserved for the very sick. They don't have the tests available to just test everyone. They're testing the very sick and they're testing the healthcare professionals to make sure that they aren't infected. And there just isn't enough to test people who are otherwise healthy or even just showing mild symptoms. If we got to the point where we had that testing capacity, then we could quickly identify the infected and then quarantine them. There was actually a village in Italy that was able to do this and essentially end their outbreak in a matter of weeks simply by testing every single person in the village and quarantining everyone who was infected because of the fact that over half of the people who are infected are asymptomatic and would otherwise be spreading it. And then finally, if there is a coordinated global lockdown to flatten the curve everywhere, as I indicated with those stock market graphs, there, the economic contagion as well as the viral contagion is global. And if your country executes an excellent lockdown like China or South Korea, it doesn't matter because as long as there's infections elsewhere, you have to keep your economy closed, you have to keep your travel closed in order to prevent reinfection. The fact that you controlled an outbreak doesn't mean people are immune. It just means you manage to contain it. And you have to continue containing it, which means uh, which means shut borders, which means 14-day quarantines for people entering the country, all of which are very bad economically. And so we need to beat this at a global level, not just at a local level. If we're able to do those things, then we could see a quick recovery. Uh, it, will not be the it will not be the same as if this uh, coronavirus hadn't happened. There will be the overhead of the massive government spending and debt incurred in order to stave off economic ruin. And that's gonna have an impact for years to come. 
but it could end up being a relatively quick recovery. However, we could be facing a much longer period if in fact some of these things happen. So right now, the only tool we have for mitigating the spread of the virus is social distancing. And that is something that is crippling economies. Entire sectors are uh, essentially showing zero revenues or negative revenues. This is terrible for the economy. Again, it may be necessary to do this in order to control the outbreak. Uh, uh, there are many, there are some who argue that uh, this outbreak is something where we should just let it run and that economically shutting down in order to prevent the outbreak or mitigate the outbreak is worse than just letting the outbreak go. To which I respond, you know, usually when hundreds of thousands of people around the world or possibly even millions of people around the world die of something and nobody can be sure whether or not they're going to get it, that has an impact on the economy as well. So unless this really is just like a seasonal flu, which I highly doubt, Shut, ending the shutdowns to boost the economy is only going to eventually cause the economy to perform worse because of the many deaths that will occur. And the other thing which is we have to watch out for is uncoordinated national and regional responses. If we look at the history of the 1918 flu and epidemic, which killed millions of people around the world, at least in the United States, we saw multiple waves of infection. And in fact, in many cases, the second wave or the third wave were worse than the first wave. People would lock down the city, they would see the infection begin to decline, they would loosen the restrictions, and then infections would surge again. And that was because they didn't have testing. And with testing, we would be able to do a better job of this, but if the testing infrastructure isn't there, there could very well be multiple waves. So, what should you be watching out for? Because I'm not gonna be doing a webinar every day. Uh, so how can you yourself look at what's happening out in the world and decide, is this going to be short or is this going to be long? The first is to look for the global flattening of the curve. So as you saw, the data I was getting was just from worldometers.info, which has proven to be one of the places that does a good job of keeping the data up to date. Look at that global graph and see if it begins to flatten out again like it did when it was still confined to China. If that happens, then you know we're getting towards the end of the epidemic. Dramatic increases in testing. If you actually are in a position where if somebody comes to you and says, we know you're healthy, but we'd like to test you, that's a great sign. That's a sign that the testing infrastructure is now there to be able to uh, begin to do a much better job of mitigation and be a much, do a much more targeted job of quarantining instead of the blanket quarantine for everyone. I do want to warn people that the restrictions being lifted aren't a good indicator. Let's say your local government says, you know what, you don't have to uh, hide out in your house anymore. Well, that's usually a trailing indicator, not a leading indicator. So it's not quick enough to really be useful to you as a business. And it might also be a precursor to another wave. If there's no effective testing or treatments, lifting restrictions might very well lead to another wave, which might be even worse than the wave of infections and deaths we've already seen. So these are the things to be watching out for. Uh, from an industry by industry perspective, the hardest hit industries are the ones which are directly affected. Travel, hospitality, and transportation are obviously all suffering greatly. I heard from one of my friends who is a partner at McKinsey that the U.S. airline industry actually has negative revenues right now because of cancellations and refunds. Imagine running your business on negative revenues, not just zero revenues, negative revenues. Food and dining, obviously very hard hit. Real estate, people aren't buying. Recruiting and hiring, people aren't hiring. The consulting firms are in deep trouble right now. Their entire model is based on in-person work and they are all essentially at a standstill. There are a small number of industries that are benefiting from a coronavirus bump. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to be in one of these, congratulations, we'll talk a little bit about how you can leverage this. Obviously, remote communications and entertainment. Everyone in the world seems to be using Zoom right now. Video game companies are seeing massive surges. Netflix is seeing massive usage. So these remote communications and entertainment are doing very well. I think Twitch is hiring like crazy as people stream all the time. E-commerce also is doing well. People are not able to leave the house to buy things. Therefore, the e-commerce players like Amazon are actually at capacity. Their sales are higher than ever before. Uh, I've heard from a number of, of, of outfits that are selling essential supplies that their sales are higher than ever before. And of course, healthcare is in a situation where utilization is going to continue to be high for quite some time. So those are definite industries which are benefiting. Now, what to do if you're like most people 
where in fact the economics of the situation are negative. Uh, the first is to reset your expectations immediately. This is something I personally failed to do. One of the things I do professionally is I travel around the world speaking at things like Rise Up and, and giving talks for corporations and conferences. And that's actually a big part of how I make my living. Uh, when the second half of February hit, I began to see my various speaking gigs get canceled or pushed off. And I didn't act decisively at that point in time. What I said and said, well, maybe there's other parts of the world where I could go and speak instead. I was, and things were looking not so good in, in Asia. So I was like, well, maybe Latin America, maybe Europe. And so I had speaking engagements lined up in the UK, in Germany, and also in Brazil. Guess what? All of those ended up being canceled in rapid or rapid fire succession as well. And if I had instead said to myself, this is going to be a global pandemic, I should not cling to how I've done things in the past. I should assume that my expectations are all wrong and that I need to develop a new set of expectations. I would have been much better off. There is no silver bullet. There is no easy solution if in fact this is hitting your business. And so you, the closer you, the faster you say, okay, Everything I know, I need to set that aside for now and I need to look at what's actually happening and decide what needs to do. The second thing you have to do is you have to do what it takes to survive for at least 90 days. The reason I say 90 days is if you look at what has happened in China, for example, uh, China disco essentially discovered the coronavirus on December 31st of 2019. They, that was the first time they reported to the World Health Organization, hey, we've got something strange going on here. And it's taken the months of January, February, and March amidst a extreme lockdown, which involved welding doors shut to keep people inside their homes, that China is beginning to lift those restrictions. So that's taken three months. Now, admittedly, with China, they were the first. So there was probably uh, about a month or so where they weren't sure what was going on. They hadn't locked everything down yet. So hopefully, if, you're, if, if your country has already acted, 90 days will be sufficient but definitely plan on at least 90 days and it could be longer. Uh, you should act decisively, avoid a partial solution. Again, don't cling to incremental solutions, act decisively on the new reality. Make sure that you have appropriately reset your expectations. For those of you who are leaders, I think it's really important to over communicate with your people to maintain the morale. They are scared, they're wondering what's going on just like you are. Uh, but what you can do is you can provide them with some sense of stability by communicating with them on a regular basis what you're thinking, what you're seeing, what you're planning to do. And it may be that you know, things are going to change and you're going to change plans rapidly. I'd be very surprised if anyone got their plan right the first time. But as long as you continue to communicate to people and make sure that their expectations are realistic and that they feel like they at least are getting transparency from you, morale will be higher than before. If it is a quick recovery, then switching back into growth mode before others realize it will give you an advantage, right? It's like being at, in, a, in a race where they've called a, a caution flag and all of a sudden everyone has to slow down, everyone's frozen in place. And then all of a sudden, if you were the first one to recognize that the caution flag has been lifted and you race out ahead for weeks uh, before your competition does, that could be a huge advantage. But if it's a lasting depression, then being realistic and decisive will give you an advantage because you'll already have been able to abandon your previous assumptions, abandon your previous expectations. You'll be realistic. One of the classic tales of this is the story of the endurance expedition led by Sir Shackleton. Uh, this is a great book that a lot of people have heard about. There's a famous polar explorer who set out in 1914 to reach Antarctica and his expedition foundered and failed when his ship was locked in the ice. And the key is that he was realistic and decisive. He very quickly pivoted from focusing on let's reach Antarctica to let's figure out how to survive. And he was always in incredibly realistic about what happened. And he told his men what was going on. And ultimately he was able to, through an amazing uh, set of leadership and an amazing adventure, crossing thousands of miles of ocean in a small rowboat, uh, hiking over land, he was able to ultimately save every single one of his men. Not a single member of that expedition passed away. So think about that kind of leadership in these times. For the one to 5% of you 
who are actually in an industry or in uh, offering a product or service, which is now suddenly in greater demand because of the coronavirus. It's a very similar set of things, but in the opposite direction. First thing is to reset your expectations immediately upwards. Understand that the demand is as high as it's ever going to be, and then do whatever it takes to keep up with demand. Uh, I've been in this situation before where demand is outstripped supply, and my message to the team was just do whatever it takes to, keep, to stay up. Keep the servers up, keep the service up, do whatever it takes to keep up with demand. If the service isn't as good as it normally is, guess what? Uh, people are going to live with it because the most important thing is availability. The key, of, the key ability is availability. Again, you need to over-communicate to maintain morale. Everyone's going to be exhausted. Uh, you aren't going to be able to quickly surge your hiring and get enough people to handle increased demand. If your demand is increased 100%, as I've heard from some of these companies, guess what? You're serving it with the same number of people. And I'm sure they're very happy to have a job. I'm sure they're very happy that the company is doing well, but they are going to be exhausted and at the edge of their, uh, of their endurance. And you need to over-communicate again to maintain the morale. One very important thing is to look for emerging behaviors to amplify. So as usage of your products or services surges, your customers will do things you don't expect. So for example, uh, when I was running Ustream, which is one of the live streaming video pioneers, one of the things that was unexpected was people would take the video streams and embed 10 of them on a single page so that people could essentially have a virtual party. And this was before coronavirus. This is over a decade ago. Well, if you look at that emerging behavior today, that is exactly what Zoom does. That is exactly what House Party does. And these things are surging. These emerging behaviors, uh, people are using your product in a way it wasn't intended. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. You can look at how they're using it. You can look at which kinds of emerging use cases are surging and then figure out simple changes to the product to amplify those emerging behaviors because this is your opportunity to really grow. But if it is a quick recovery, ironically enough, you need to be ready to return to normal. In other words, uh, if you run a factory that makes, makes masks, don't permanently expand. Don't say, oh, wow, you know what? This demand for masks that I'm seeing right now, this is what it's going to be for the next several decades. Recognize that it's a moment. And be ready to return to normal. Look at those leading indicators. Look at the growth. Look at the usage. And if the usage starts to decline, recognize, you know what? We made hay while the sun shone. That was great but let's also expect that things are going to return to normal. I do not expect Zoom, I expect uh, after normalcy returns that Zoom usage rates will be higher than before, but they will be nothing like as high as they are right now. And that's something that businesses that are lucky enough to be experiencing this have to keep in mind. Uh, some of the ways that we at Global Scaling Academy have adapted, uh, the first is to invest in remote working infrastructure. This means having secondary devices for video conferencing, having accessories, mounts, tripods, lighting. I can tell you right now, I am in my home studio. I, as I look around me, I see a screen on which I can uh, project presentations if I need to. I see two different tripods, one for the table, one for the floor in case I need to full length. I see uh, a, a lighting fixture that I've set up in order to provide lighting when it's uh, during nighttime. These are all things that you as a company can do because at the end of the day, uh, if everyone is going to be working remotely, investing in that infrastructure will be worth it. Connect with your customers virtually. Do Zoom office and, and happy hours, uh, presentations like this one where you're able to connect with people. And one of the things we're doing is we're building up and we'll soon be announcing and rolling out an online community for people to connect during this time. Because during a period of social distancing, it's really important that people socialize distantly. Right? To overcome the isolation, we have to socialize more than ever before, and we have to do it online and virtually. And finally, think about offering remote products or services. Yes, nothing substitutes for people being face-to-face. -face. There's a magic in being face-to-face -face and being able to shake hands and do all those things. But those are things we can't do right now. And there are advantages to remote products and services as well. Uh, obviously, this is going to be difficult if you're a massage therapist, and I uh, apologize if you are. But for other people, you know, let's say you normally run events. Well, what are the costs of running an event? There's enormous costs to renting a venue, to having everyone fly there, to people paying for hotels, to having food and catering and so on and so forth. 
you can use the lower costs of the virtual realm to charge lower prices and potentially reach larger audiences. And when we return to normal, that larger audience will be people that you can then turn to and offer your traditional in-person products and services as well. So of course, this coronavirus pandemic is a terrible thing and it is bad for most of us, but we should reset our expectations, accept that it is bad. Wishing it weren't bad won't make it go away. We should understand what the reality is and then optimize our actions now to make sure that when normalcy returns, we're able to take advantage of it as much as possible and use that recovery as a booster to get us closer to where we once were. Finally, I know that a lot of this has been somewhat pessimistic, uh, but I want to give you guys reasons to hope because I do think I am ultimately optimistic about what's going to happen in the world. I do not believe that this is some sort of thing that is going to permanently cripple our economy. Some countries have been able to contain this. We've seen countries, obviously China, South Korea, Taiwan, they've all been able to contain this. Uh, and my own piece of advice to you is wear masks when you go outside. Uh, I, have my, I have my masks, which I wear when I go grocery shopping, which I wear when I walk my dog. Again, they've been telling us here in the United States, oh, it won't protect you. That's BS. Of course, it's going to protect you at least some. It won't offer perfect protection. They don't want people to be overconfident. But obviously, nobody says, you know what you should do during this? You should wander around outside with your mouth open. That doesn't make any sense. So wear masks. And more importantly, if you are already infected and don't know it, wearing a mask will reduce your chances of infecting others. So definitely wear masks. I don't think it's a coincidence that the countries that have been able to contain this are countries where there's a lot of mask wearing. Uh, there are hundreds of clinical trials underway for treatments and vaccines right now. Uh, there were zero, obviously, on January 1st. So in just three months, the world has mobilized a significant portion of its intellectual firepower around this. Uh, I am a strong believer in the power of human ingenuity. I am confident that we're going to find something that will help us here. And scientists and doctors are working on it right now. The 1918 influenza pandemic was followed by a period of sustained global growth. There were, in the United States, the Roaring Twenties followed the influenza pandemic, even though 675,000 Americans died in that pandemic, which, by the way, is more Americans that had died in any single war or conflict, even more than the civil war between the North and South. So a pandemic is not going to permanently cripple growth. In fact, uh, hopefully there will continue to be growth afterwards. This may have brought on recessions, this may have brought an end to one period of growth, but after we get through this, I am hopeful that we will be able to have another period of growth as well. Uh, and finally, this is not the zombie apocalypse, even if it sometimes feels that way. I think people go outside, they see nobody else around, they see the isolation, they feel like this is some sort of horror movie. Just remember, uh, this is not something like SARS, where 10% of the people who get it die, or MERS, where 30%, or Ebola, where 60% of the people die. This is something where for the majority of people, it will be mild. That being said, don't take any chances because even if you're young and healthy, you could end up in an intensive care unit or even passing away. But this is ultimately not the zombie apocalypse and be hopeful that we will get through this. So uh, that's a quick rundown of my take on the coronavirus pandemic. You can follow me on Twitter at Chris Ye. You can learn more about what we're doing at the Global Scaling Academy at globalscalingacademy.com. And I will turn things over and, and stop the sharing in just a second so that we can go to the Q&A session. And again, I know I've been speaking very quickly, but I will slow down and go back over anything that you guys ha might have missed along the way. Thank you so much, Chris. That was, uh, I had a few talking points prepared, but you addressed pretty much everything. So <laughs> that's really, uh, that's really wonderful and very helpful. And um, a uh, unique voice of uh, hope, tentative hope, I guess, uh, is a one way to put it. Um, and then sort of what feels like an avalanche of really bad news. So um, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, I have a couple questions on my end, and then we also have questions coming in from, uh, from people who are listening. Um, but one thing I wanted to sort of touch on is there's, um, uh, there's been some talk recently of uh, viewing a potential... Uh, recession or economic downturn is actually an opportunity for some startups with people drawing on examples like Uber and Airbnb, like, oh, these companies came up within like the context or the aftermath of 2008. And, uh, and perhaps the situation that we're facing right now could present a similar kind of opportunity. 
Um, I'm wondering what you think about that um, in terms of sort of new, new ventures spurring out of this. Yes, I do think that it, we see a history where great companies tend to be started during difficult times. So it is absolutely the case that starting a startup during a recession is very difficult, but if you succeed, you have certain unique advantages. The first, of course, is the relative lack of competition. Uh, during tough times, many fewer people are starting companies because it's just so much more difficult. But if you're able to persevere and succeed, then you have a lot more time available to run and grow before other imitators jump in. And if there's any lesson that you should take away from Blitzscaling, which is, of course, the book that Reid Hoffman and I wrote, is that if you're in something which truly has a winner-take-most market dynamic, then the ability to reach critical scale before your competitors is the way you become a global giant with enduring market leadership. So there absolutely is great opportunity. Uh, that's of little uh, comfort to those people who are currently in the market, running their companies, who suddenly find their revenues drying up and have to find a way to keep going. But for those people, even, even if this current, let's say, let's say you're running a travel company and you're unfortunately forced to shut down. That doesn't mean that you failed. Uh, what it means is that you ran into an exogenous event that nobody really foresaw happening, nobody really expected to happen. And if you take the lessons from that and you apply them during this recession and start a new company and are able to grow from that, you may very well get a, a great result that's from it. So again, it's important to note my co-author, co Reed Hoffman, had started a company called Social, Tech, Social Net, which was the very first social networking company that he created. And that was during the dot-com boom and it failed. And then in 2002, 2003, he started LinkedIn, which is a company that obviously went on to great success, even though this took place during a, a horrendous recession. And again, similar ideas, similar concept, less competition. There was an opportunity for him to really build an amazing business. Mm, interesting. Um, and you also mentioned uh, how some people are experiencing uh, a bump, uh, whether it's uh, companies like Netflix or Zoom or uh, things that people are really relying on these uh, um, uh, in like this current period. Um, I am a bit, sometimes I'm a little bit wary when people think of this in terms of translating in terms of long-term growth. Um, right. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that. Uh, um, are we likely to see uh, these patterns continue uh, sort of post-crisis? Um, and if they will, will they be to the scale that they are right now? So some of the, many of these patterns will continue post-crisis, but they won't be at the scale they are right now. Hmm. So obviously, for example, let's take the usage of remote working, Zoom, Slack, et cetera. Uh, right now, people can't interact face-to-face. -face, so all of it has to be moved electronically. It's been an enormous shift. And I think it will dramatically push forward the adoption of remote working in general. But when this crisis ends, we're not gonna remain 100% remote. Human beings do better face-to-face -face in many cases. And mm. so we are going to see a decline. However, if you make a great product during this time and people sample it and try it, they will develop the habit of using it. And even if they're not gonna use Zoom as much as they did as they do right now, they will still use it more than they did before. So I think it's very possible that you know, if you're seeing a 100% increase in your business now, afterwards you may still have a baseline 15, 20, 25% increase over what was before the pandemic. Interesting. I'm uh, going to take a turn now to these Q&As we have here. Uh, we have one about um, uh, what permanent changes do you foresee happening to consumer trends post COVID-19? I think we've just touched on this slightly. Um, uh, perhaps, I don't know if you, you're considering um, in industries that aren't necessarily about remote communication or entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, are we looking at perhaps more long-term impacts on other industries? So I think that there will be long-term impact on a number of things like travel. Uh, but even then, you know, I think it's important to know, let's take a look at something like 9-11 which obviously had a huge impact on the travel industry uh, because of the threat to airlines and airliners. Ultimately, the travel industry did recover from that. And I think that with COVID-19, if you look at the past history of the Spanish influenza, did the world remain closed forever after that terrible, terrible pandemic? No, the answer is not. 
So I think that the, the, the question really is looking at the short term versus the long term versus the medium term. So in the short term, obviously, the travel industry is completely dead. In the medium term, that is in the next one to two years, there may very well be declines as people are like, you know what? There's still this residual fear or concern. I, I don't know if I really want to go until I'm sure this is behind us. But three to five years out, I do not foresee there being a permanent impact on the travel industry. That doesn't mean that some of the companies might not go out of business, but other companies will arise to take their place. Okay, makes sense. Um, and another question we have here is, uh, what's the business impact of companies getting back to normal a little too early? Is this considered a thought leading move? Too risky, maybe? It's clear medically this would be risky, but what about the actual business itself? This is from Bishoy Sabri. Yep. So the way I look at this is, is a question of whether getting back to normal a little too quickly, in fact, puts more people at risk medically. Uh, because mm -hmm. people will remember what you did, and if it resulted in infections and it resulted in problems, I think that that would have some long-term reputational effects. So, for example, uh, if we look at the sort of outrage that we've seen around young people uh, still having parties, going to the beach, and so on and so forth, I think that that is a negative. I think that there will be, uh, when the storybooks are written, uh, there will be names that are highlighted, people who move too slowly. So I think from a business perspective, I would rather not uh, take that risk because ultimately as a business, if you take that risk and you fail, well, that could have a devastating impact on your business. You would lose people's trust. And so it is better to be a little more conservative there. But mm. again, uh, it is a delicate balance because if you're able to look at the curves and you see the flattening of the curve and you see things moving in the right directions, then being aggressive out of the gates once you've been cleared to do that, could be very effective. Okay. And I'm pulling uh, questions also from the Facebook live feed. Sure. Uh, uh, we have Mayim Hasseini, uh, who is asking about the clothing industry. Uh, and uh, she's, she says the in-store sales are completely down right now for obvious reasons, but digi and digital, as well as digital sales, how do I overcome this situation? So it's difficult uh, in a situation where the demand has just cratered, it's difficult to fully overcome it, right? The reason why we've seen this dramatic decline is pretty simple. If you don't have to leave the house and nobody sees you, I mean, just imagine the impact on pants sales. It's going to be terrible because nobody actually sees the bottom half of our bodies anymore. Uh, I kid a little bit, but the point, is, the point is that clothing is a discretionary expenditure. And right now there is not a driving force to get people to buy more clothing. And that is unfortunate. Uh, what, I would say, what I would say is in this case, you know, what you could be doing is you could be finding ways to engage with the community that do not involve them necessarily buying clothes, although it could lead to that. So for example, maybe if you're a retailer and you have a list of customers, you put on a virtual fashion show to give people something to entertain them and distract them. Mm. And by the way, by doing that, they may see some items and say, oh, I really like that. And that may actually result in some orders. So I think that the answer is to find ways to engage, similar to the ones we sort of described already, in this online and virtual way. Understand that it may not lead directly to sales, but it will keep your customers in your orbit and potentially give you the ability to rebound more rapidly. Sure. And, and a related, uh, on a related note, um, I was wondering what you thought about some companies pivoting uh, their, what, they're, what they're offering. We just saw an example of this in Tunisia. I think there was a startup that was uh, um, offering a taxi service and they decided in the meantime to switch to sort of delivery services and only, do, only offer uh, the taxi services at night for police officers and, and healthcare professionals who sort of have to move around. And I thought it was a really interesting um, case of adaptation, but I don't know how um, applicable it is to other companies. So I think you, you, can, you can think creatively about this. Mm. And if there is a way to uh, pivot, and in many cases that, as you heard with the example you gave, and I'll give you another example, the pivot involves working with the governments because right now the governments are the ones who are spending money. They're printing money mm. or borrowing money or to spend it, but that is actually appropriate given the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, there's a company uh, I, I've worked with through the Women's Startup Lab called Prontopia that's actually based in Italy. So you can imagine how difficult it is. Now, Prontopia 
what Prontopia does as a business is it offers in-person guides for travelers. So just imagine you're running a travel business in Italy that focuses on in-person interactions. Yeah. I'm not sure how much worse you can get than that. But the, the founder has done a brilliant job. She actually pivoted and is working with the various governments uh, in, in the cities where she's based to use her guides to deliver groceries and other needed supplies to elderly residents who can't leave their homes. And so she's actually making government revenues during this time, keeping her guides, uh, making money. Obviously they're taking uh, a lot more precautions, wearing masks, using sanitizer and the like. But in this environment, if you can find a way to work with the local authorities and to serve some of the needs that have now arisen that weren't, didn't exist before, uh, even somebody who is an Italian in-person travel company can find ways to pivot. Sure. Um, again, here from uh, Mohammed Aheb on Zoom. How do you think uh, COVID-19 will affect angel investors and venture capital in general? Um, so, so that's an excellent question. And again, we're still seeing how this is going to play out. I believe that there are several things I can say with a fair degree of certainty. The first is that angel investors will be affected more than venture capitalists. The reason is angel investors tend to be investing out of their own balance sheet. And mm -hmm. most angel investors therefore don't have a giant bank account of cash. Uh, like, but that's not the way people work. They generally keep it in the market. And because of market declines, angel investors are feeling a lot poorer than they were a number of months ago. Mm -hmm. And that wealth effect has an impact on angel investments, just like everything else. Yes, there will be a few angel investors who are like, this is the perfect chance to buy. Valuations are down. You know, when there's blood in the streets, you should invest. That's the famous Rothschild saying. But the majority of angel investors are not in this for economic reasons. They're in it for non-economic reasons. And if they're worried about their own wealth, if they're worried about their own health, they're really not going to make a priority of making investments. On the other hand, I think venture capitalists, they invest out of a permanent pool of capital that's sitting there. It's in cash. It's not like it's in the market. And they have the ability to invest where if they place an investment in a company, they know that company has enough funds for several years. And so they can more easily afford to look long-term. So I predict that angel investors will be hit harder than venture capital investors. And one thing I did also mention is I predict that valuations will obviously be affected. Uh, mm -hmm. The public markets are ultimately the governor of, of valuations because eventually people expect to either sell their company to a publicly traded company or take their company public. So if the public markets get whacked by 20%, that's going to have an impact on valuations. It'll have a greater impact on later stage and earlier stage, but it's going to ultimately affect everyone. Sure. And um, another question concerns uh, drawing the line between uh, potentially seeing uh, opportunities in this crisis, but then also exploiting it on like an immoral level or sort of, uh, uh, yeah, exploiting people's need for certain products or services. Um, I think we've seen a, quite, a, quite a significant amount of price gouging, for example, um, uh, for a lot of products, but I feel like this could also happen on the startup level too. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, I think it's really a question of whether you're playing the short game or the long game. One of the mm -hmm. things that we're seeing in the United States is people are setting up, I don't know, all sorts of businesses around importing masks and selling them. And the price of masks has increased by a factor of 10 over the past several months. Uh, that's something where, you know, because the need is so acute, it may very well be that some of these people will be able to make a, a bunch of money by securing supply early and being able to sell those masks. Uh, and that's really a short-term play because it's not like this is going to be a business, you know, two years from now. It's not like the person who happened into a factory in China and ported a bunch of masks is now going to be in the mask business because it's not like the hospitals are going to say, you know what, that person who gouged us, that's the person I want to buy from in the future. So in the short run, those kinds of behaviors may be effective. You just have to be rec uh, cognizant of the fact that it is purely short run. In the long run, Obviously, the name of the game is having people's trust. And if you are able to handle your business in a way that builds people's trust in you, then you have a long-term advantage. And price gouging and things like that do not generate trust, do not generate goodwill. Uh, you should only do those things if you believe that you're in the short game and you're going to get out of it uh, in, in, near, in the near term and this is not your permanent gig. Hmm. 
um, here on Zoom, Matil, Mat I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this name, Matilde, uh, is asking, what are your expectations regarding uh, early stage investments into African startups? The situation feels even less predictable on all the levels for the African continent. Um, yes, uh, uh, there, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, it is not one where I have a, a great, hugely optimistic answer. I think the long run, uh, I have a lot of long-term optimism around Africa from a demographic perspective, from an overall economic growth perspective. But obviously, in the short term, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. The venture markets tend to be less developed. So as a result, there are fewer of these deep-pocketed, been around for 30, 40, 50 year venture capital firms that will be able to continue investing during this downturn. Governments may pick up the slack. I mean, this will be interesting to see, although typically in this kind of emergency situation, the government does not, governments do not turn around and start handing the money to startups. They tend to hand the money to established companies. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. Uh, I would say that you know, the other factor that's there is in African countries where the public health system is already overburdened or uh, struggles to uh, serve all the people, it will make the pandemics even more dangerous and difficult to contain. So there will be a lot of uncertainty ahead. I wish I could give you a more optimistic answer. Uh, I will say that what you should do is to focus on the players that have been around the longest if you're raising money, to focus on institutional investors that have an established pool of money for investing rather than the individual angel investors. Sure, and uh, another person is uh, asking uh, your advice on labor. Should a business cut down on some of its labor? Uh, what if the economy picks up in a couple of months? What do we do then? Yeah, so it really is a question of what your financial situation looks like. So here in the United States, there are a number of very famous restaurateurs. So Danny Meyer is one of the great restaurateurs. He had a, a variety of restaurants, including Shake Shack, by the way, which mm -hmm. is a very famous chain over here in the United States. Thomas Keller is the, the chef who runs the French Laundry, generally considered the, the greatest restaurant in the United States. Uh, you may remember he was the creative consultant for the Pixar movie Ratatouille, and he was actually the one who cooked the ratatouille that they based the ratatouille in the, in the movie on. So these are iconic, successful Mount Rushmore legends of the game, and all of them have been forced to lay off nearly all their staff. And the reason is that in the case of a restaurant, it's all labor and all overhead, and they have almost zero revenue coming in because it may be that from an essentials perspective, there are people getting takeout. There are very few people saying, you know what I want tonight? $500 takeout. Yeah. And so I would say that, you know, you are probably going to have to cut down your labor. Again, expect this to last at least 90 days. And if you cannot support paying your labor force for 90 days with zero revenues, if you're in that kind of situation, you don't really have a choice. Uh, now, mm -hmm. how you handle those layoffs is a big deal, right? So uh, a lot of, uh, some of these chefs have done, ver I've seen a variety of things they've done. So for example, uh, they, gave, they paid people through some period of March or even through April, or they continued their health insurance for longer. Uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, the Michael Mina restaurant group here in the Bay Area. So for example, one of the things they've done is he's retained a small staff and they're preparing meals for all laid off members of staff and their families. So that if you're a staff member and you're laid off, you can, still, you can still make sure that you'll be able to be fed because you can just go to the restaurant and they will give you food every single day. So there are things like that that you can do that are going to, I think, dramatically change the behavior of labor if and when, uh, when rather, when things return to normal. Uh, are you going to be more willing to go back to work for someone who continued your health insurance and provided you with free food during that time? Or are you going to be more likely to go back to someone who told you via an email, you're laid off, good luck? Mm -hmm. um, I have quite a, quite a number of questions related to marketing. So I feel like I'm going to try to consolidate. Condense, by all means. Uh, <laughs> but it seems like a lot of people are wondering, um, to what extent should we focus on uh, marketing spending at the moment? Uh, across industries, there's someone here from an electronics business, health tech, a bunch of people asking, I guess for health tech, it would be a little bit different, but um, uh, I guess we could address first uh, industries that are not directly related to the crisis versus mm -hmm. industries like um, health tech or, or e-commerce, for example, that are particularly relevant. 
Well, I think that this is another great case where you're going to be able to see the results in your numbers and look at your leading indicators. So anybody who is a marketer is watching probably on a weekly, if, certainly on a weekly, possibly on a daily basis, the effects of their spending. So you're going in, you're looking at your AdWords, you're looking at your Facebook, you're looking at all these things and seeing what's the click-through rate doing? What's the conversion rate doing? What does my funnel look like? And based on that data, you'll be able to know whether or not this uh, crisis is impacting that overall funnel. And if the crisis is making the funnel less efficient, then obviously this is not a particularly good time to spend. If, mm -hmm. the, however, the crisis is making the funnel more efficient or it's staying relatively the same and you feel like you have an opportunity to make, maybe make inroads into the market, it could be a good time to spend. But your own marketing metrics will tell you that, right? You should be able to tell from your own metrics, is this an effective time to spend or not, independent of the pandemic? Sure. Um, okay, let's maybe switch over to some Facebook questions and I will sure. ask a couple of minutes. And again, I apologize that we can't get to all the questions. Uh, obviously, yeah. this is something that everyone's really focused on these days. Um, if you can just give me one second. Um, By the way, if somebody asked which book I mentioned, so there are two books I mentioned. One is my own book, Blitz Scaling, B-L-I-T-Z-S-C-A-L-I-N-G. You can find that at bookstores everywhere. The other book I sort of referenced was uh, Endurance, which is the story of the Shackleton Expedition. And that is a very popular book you can probably get from the library or, or, or buy online. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I have a health tech related question here. Um, thinking about a health tech startup in Egypt, should we aim to target markets locally or regionally, given the differences in infrastructure and country regulations? I think given the situation we're in right now, where a lot of borders are likely to be closed, it's just easier to target locally for the time being. Uh, it, it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult time. Uh, there may be more travel restrictions coming. There may be more quarantines coming. Uh, especially as countries respond to this and see different, uh, different rates of infection or return to normalcy. So I would say staying within your boundaries is probably a smart move for now. But hey, if an incredible opportunity arises, uh, then by all means seize it. Just recognize it's more difficult during this time. Sure. And um, do you see people using public transportation less in the forthcoming period post-COVID era? Um, how could ride-sharing companies uh, capitalize on this? If So assuming that we actually see a return to normal, which is to say we get effective treatments, we have testing, and eventually we have a vaccine, uh, I don't believe that public transportation is going to permanently crater. I think that this is a temporary thing, and if people believe that life is returned to normal, they will return to using public transportation as well. However, from a ride-sharing perspective, one of the things you absolutely can do is just as you, I, I mentioned, investing in remote work, making sure. Uh, so, for example, I'm an investor in a ride sharing company that's very specialized. They provide ride sharing for non emergency medical transportation. It's a company called Send a Ride, based in the Midwest of the United States, Oklahoma and Texas. And they were able, the, the, the founder there is a brilliant, brilliant leader and entrepreneur. And she was able to get out in front and obtain sanitizer and wipes before all the supplies were cleaned out. And she supplied them to all the drivers. And so, you know, one of the things they could say is, you know, we have wipes, we have sanitization, everything is clean in comparison to some of the competitors or something like that. So I do think that there are ways to leverage this if you're in the ride sharing business. Uh, but I do believe that over time, there will not be a dramatic decline in, in public transportation. I foresee a return to normal. Sure. Um, and uh, I guess on a final note, um, what are your thoughts on the uh, sort of U.S. Uh, um, uh, the, the package that was just passed, the $2 trillion package? Do you think this could potentially lead to a situation of hyperinflation or do you think it's actually much needed at the moment? Um, and perhaps if it'll have any global ramifications? So the general economic consensus is that it is needed. So there is a, Matt, this is the largest shock to the economic system the United States has ever faced. And if not now, then when would you use the government's mm -hmm. ability to borrow and print money? I mean, I guess we could wait until there is an asteroid that hits the world or until aliens invade. But other than that, this is the biggest thing we've ever seen. This is the single largest shock in the history of the United States. 
So I think it is appropriate to try to cushion the blow, and this is what people look for governments to do. Now, the long-term implications are also pretty straightforward. This is massive borrowing, and this is going to result in having to pay more someday, and we will eventually have a bill come due, and this will be a drag on the future, which is why we don't just, under normal circumstances, say, hey, you know what we should do? Let's borrow $2 trillion and give it to people, right? Because yeah. that's not a good thing. But this is a global pandemic. So I don't believe, for example, that this package and the fiscal fallout from it is going to result in people saying, well, you know what, we're going to abandon the dollar as a reserve currency. I don't mm -hmm. foresee that kind of, of massive change. I think mm -hmm. that it, it's actually a good thing for the rest of the world in general that the United States is doing this because so much of the world depends on the demand of the United States consumer economy, right? This is the world's largest market uh, for imports. And if the United States economy suffers, then almost every other company, every other economy in the world suffers in some way. So it is a benefit to the world that this stimulus is going on. Sure. And I guess the, a related question that has come up quite a bit is, uh, um, would this crisis bring China closer to becoming a global uh, market leader? Uh, and I think a lot of people are wondering this, especially with regards to the, the, the steps that it's forcing um, the U.S. government to take, really, from a fiscal perspective. Yeah, so I think that uh, it is possible that this will end up going well for the Chinese government. Uh, the key factor in this is going to be twofold. The first is, is the, is the coronavirus outbreak truly contained? Uh, there is some evidence that suggests that the Communist Party there is suppressing some of the statistics to make things look even better than they are. And mm -hmm. if this leads to a second outbreak, a secondary wave of deaths and things like that, uh, then it's going to be a rebound effect where having beaten their chests and said, hey, look, we fixed this and those idiots in the United States didn't, uh, it's going to have a negative impact. But overall, I would say the baseline case is that it is a positive. They demonstrated their ability to contain it. And China has been fairly proactive in donating to other countries. This is a good opportunity for them to do so, especially since the Trump administration is unlikely to follow suit. So this is probably good in general. Uh, I do think that uh, overall, while the United States is not always a benign actor in any way, shape, or form, it's obviously a self-interested actor. In general, the United States' interests are better aligned with the rest of the world than China's interests. And so I don't foresee it as being like a tipping point that causes China to become a global hegemon. I think that there are some fundamental issues that sort of get in the way of that. Uh, but I do think that this crisis and the contrast between the Chinese handling of it and the uh, Trump administration handling of it will be a positive for China. Sure. Um, all right. I don't want to take up any more of your time. <laughs> We're already a couple minutes over, but this has been massively helpful. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all the questions that were available, but um, if this were a five-hour session, <laughs> I guess we could have tried. Uh, but thanks again, Chris. It was really great to get to speak to you. Um, uh, and meet virtually, as I guess everybody else is meeting these days. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a great evening, great morning, great afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. And just again, let me reiterate, we have reason for optimism. We will get through this. Things are bad now, but this will be a good time to start new businesses. There will always be room for human ingenuity and entrepreneurship. A wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Gayan. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.